Okay, guys, let's get uh, started. Uh, the topic that I chose, obviously, I'm, I'm a cardiologist. My specialization is electrophysiology. So pacemaker and ICDs is something we do all the time. Uh, the, the reason I got this particular topic for internal medicine is I always thought that this is one fact, uh, one part of cardiology where usually uh, internists and family practice doctors, the moment they see pacemaker and defibrillator, they say, well, call cardiology, it's, it's nothing to do with us. And, but uh, what has happened over the last 10, 15 years, uh, there are more and more patients who have devices and more and more patients have uh, device related issues and more and more internists and hospitalists are dealing with this thing. And even the board exams are catching up with it, which means they're now starting to ask uh, common problems with pacemakers, common indications and things like that. So this is an attempt to do both, sort of help you for both. And when we did the board review last week, this part I could not get to, which actually works out now you can get finish this part. And also <coughs> on a day-to-day -day practice and clinical practice. So I will give this lecture in two ways to help you both understand for board exams and for your day-to-day -day practice. So. Uh, disclosures none. As I, as I said, this is the industry that where we have uh, three or four different uh, big companies with devices. Again, I have no um, disclosures with anybody. No, no, don't, I don't, I'm not a speaker for any of their uh, topics. Um, again, goals and objectives of this lecture, we'll go through some of the guidelines, just understanding the basic concept and some questions and misconceptions and terminologies and end of life issues and cardiac devices. Uh, this part has been, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, this is not, the light is not showing up. The last one, which says end of life issues and cardiac devices, uh, it's, it, it was a very <coughs> controversial topic about 15 years back and slowly they've made it less and more and more clearer. And in the last couple of years, a very good guidelines what to do and all the stuff. So there could be a question on your exam where it's, if you could use this and they'll, be, they'll not ask complex question, but there'll be a simple question where they'd want you to know what you would do. And I think it's a legitimate question for an, in, they, that's one of those things, they would not say call EP, call cardiology, they as an internist, you gotta make a decision. And even though you would do it in your real life to call EP to turn off the pacemaker or defibrillator, but they would want you to know this. We'll get there in a second. Okay, I'll start with the case presentation just to get these things going in the right direction. Uh, 72 year old male, severe coronary artery disease, bypass, again, um, uh, his EF is 28, uh, he's also on lysinopril. His stress test is performed, which shows a fixed defect and no ischemia. Which of the following is the next uh, best option uh, in this patient? Um, so there is a, there's a patient who's got coronary artery disease, an ejection fraction of 28%, uh, currently on Coreg, aspirin, and statins. He's on good medical therapy. Blood pressure is 100 by 60. What they're telling is there's not much of room to work with any more medicine. A stress test is performed which shows a fixed defect and no ischemia, which of the following is the next best option. So we have five choices, left heart cath, uh, addition of Coumadin, balloon pump, ICDs and cardiac transplant. That's actually a very good question on board exam. I think all I need to do is I may have to give you a little bit more about the chronology of the timing. The, if I, what the thing that is missing here is uh, anybody, anybody suggestions, what would you want to do here? Obviously, this is a lecture based on devices and I'm talking about it. So you're going to say, ICD. yeah, it's always, a, ICD is always a good guess when I'm, when I'm standing. Um, but on your exam, I'm not there. So you'll start to see other people also. So you'll start thinking, what should we do next? The one, one thing that is missing here is, um, anybody, what is missing? Huh? Rhythm by V, an EKG like you are. Uh, but the choice is defibrillator. It could be by V. Nothing. Anything else missing? We're not missing. Just an additional information. Coronary. It's Neil somewhere. Oh, Neil is all the way. I heard your voice. Yes, Neil. You don't know how long this has been going on. The etiology of his failure. You don't know his coronary anatomy, whether or not he's ischemic. If you have a stress test, it shows you have no reversible ischemia. Okay. The stress test is good enough. But uh, in a way, you suggested that. Oh, it's the only thing missing, correct. In a way, everybody's alluding to the same thing. What they wanted to say is, patient has cardiomyopathy, patient has coronary artery disease. You did an ischemic workup, which shows a fixed effect. You don't have to go farther than that. However, what is missing is, your ejection fraction is 28% today. You recognize it for the first time, and he's on good medical therapy. You need to do something to make sure that you're given a chance for the ejection fraction to improve. So the, the information that is missing here, I should have given is, 
that he has been on good medical therapy for quite some time and there are two different echocardiograms showing that the ejection fraction is about the same. What they want, don't want you to do is put a defibrillator on a patient who do the echocardiogram today for the first time and say EF is out, tomorrow let's do the ICD. They don't want to do that. So what we are coming here, a couple of uh, things you just want to think about. Left heart cat is, some people may do it, but it's not a class one because you know there's a fixed defect, the scar tissue you're not going to go anywhere. Addition of cumidin, there's no reason to think about it. Intraatic balloon pump, really nothing to do. It's actually a very easy question in that way, but if you want to dissect it, you'd want to know the timing on it. Uh, so we'll come back to the same question. There's another question here, we'll come back to this topics. 69 year old male patient, hospital for CHF diuresis, fourth admission in the last one year, severe cardiomyopathy, EF is 25, an appropriate medical therapy, is considered for a device therapy for heart failure management. Which of the following is an approved indication for cardiac resynchronization therapy or by me? This is no longer a cardiology fellow question. This is a classic internal medicine ABAM question, okay? When I was a resident, actually trials were not even out. So if anybody talks about by we, we would have been, oh, this is above my head, I'm not gonna think about it. Um, even in 2006, 2007, not a question for internists. But when you start following MEXAP, 2009, 2010, if you see the MEXAP, they started talking about CRT. By we is what you guys know as commonly by we. By we also stands for cardiac resynchronization therapy. So they want you to know the indication for a by V ICD. They, now they not only need to know about ICD, you need to know when you put a by V ICD. And the answer here will come back is, is somebody with? C, C, underlying left bundle branch block with a wide width of 138. We'll come back here. But the, I just wanted to put two, two questions that are very likely to be on board exams. Not both of them, one of them at least. Um, chronic AFib on anticoagulation, beta blocker, two syncope, six, six second pause. There's a few case presentations here. We'll, we will come back to this thing after all the cases here. So now questions that you want to know from the internist perspective, common questions uh, that people would want to know. Um, the terminologist, uh, does the patient feel pacing and shock? This has been asked multiple times. People say, well, I have a pacemaker. Do I feel my heart uh, when I pace? Uh, the answer is no, right? You do not feel the pacemaker pacing you. However, in a selected few patients, selected few patients, they can actually know that they're getting pace. And just, to, just for teaching purposes, if somebody had a pacemaker put in the day before, okay, and you, the patient is admitted to your service, or for some reason he's on your service, and the next morning patient said, doc, I'm, I'm feeling the pacing, okay? There's a few things you should think. Again, you probably still call the cardiologist and take care of this, but as, a, as if you're a hospitalist in that situation, what are the couple of things you should think if you put a pacemaker and the next morning he's actually feeling it? He feels, I feel the pacemaker thing. What if the patient says, I'm feeling hiccups? Correct. So when you put a pacemaker wire, you're putting it in the RV apex, right? Uh, in the past, the leads used to be uh, thicker, uh, stars much more stronger. You could actually perfor perforate the RV. If you perforate the RV, you're hooking up to the diaphragm. And they can have diaphragmatic, actually I still remember from residency days, uh, diaphragmatic stim. They get stimulation of the diaphragm. They start, the classic is they feel hiccups. Or if you get a bi-V ICD and you get a left ventricular lead on the outside of the left ventricle, your phrenic nerve runs right there you could get diaphragmatic stimulation, okay? Rarely patients feel just the pacing heart rate going fast, they feel it. But if anybody says that's what one think about, think about. Now if defibrillator shocking, even a patient gets a shock, 99% of the patients feel the shock. Actually there's one patient in my clinic last week had a shock in the middle of the day, she didn't feel it. That's very, very, very rare. Why should you know about it? When you talk about putting a defibrillator in anybody, that is a part of discussion before you put it. If things were to go wrong, you may get shocked and you probably feel it. Okay, because the patients, when you get shocked, you never told me about this, I would never have had, I would never have gotten an ICD because ICD shocks, uh, if anybody wants to do med psych going in that direction, ICD shocks are categorized in PTSD multiple times. If you have, if you have a patient who had a VD storm and he had like four or five shocks or six, seven shocks, and if you follow them in your clinic, you would know that their personality changes. A lot of them have depression, a lot of them have PTSD, anxiety, 
and uh, they were so much worried about it. It's a clear change, and I see it in, from my side because I do it all the time. So a different person. So it is a part of your training. So there are some med psych doctors um, who are actually uh, do specialization in this particular field, and they actually do uh, like you know how there are um, I see there are alcohol treatment groups, and the, there is an ICD patients with ICD and group. Obviously, they club all ICDs, but predominantly they are talking to patients who had shocks. So in very big centers, when you have recurrent VT storm, you do a part of treatment, everything, and then say, refer him to this group where there will be support and all this stuff, because this could be terrible. If you guys have seen uh, uh, post-bypass depression and all, it can be very, very difficult uh, patient to deal with. So it's one of the things you have to know. Uh, commonly asked question, microwave, because they'll ask you before they ask me, uh, because you guys tell you may need a pacemaker, or can I work with the microwave? And, it's a very popular question in the United States, and the answer is yes. And I always say this, unless you sit in the microwave, you should be okay. So microwaves should not be a problem, because that's a common question people have. Cell phones and pacemakers and devices, not a problem. Some cell phones, the devices go right here, and if you have a pocket here and you put it here, rarely can interfere. So if you, as long as you're speaking, keeping it in the pocket, you're okay. So cell phones are not a problem. All. What you have to worry about is strong radiomagnetic field. Strong radiomagnetic field is what you have to worry about. Uh, CT scan, not a problem. However, one thing about CT scans and pacemakers. Uh, many young radiologists, when they see a patient who had a CT scan and a pacemaker, they usually overread one thing. They always say, uh, suspect RV lead perforation. I've seen it like two, three times on a patient who's had pacemaker for like 10 years. No reason to perforate now, it's already stuck very well. When they take CT images and you know the, the movement of the heart and the pacemaker, they're not synchronous. Like you know when the heart beats as opposed to, so I don't know if you guys, do me a favor, when you get a chance, look at all the, any patient who have a pacemaker, pull the chest x-ray just for fun. Many times you'll actually see two pacemaker lead shadows. The right atrial lead, it looked like there's a shadow and there's a shadow because it's like almost like moving. It's taking a snapshot and it's moving so fast, it looked like there are two leads. So CT scan, the heart and the pacemaker wires move at a different way. So it may sometimes project as though it's coming out. And they usually train them, but I've had two radiologists call this and, and patient got scared and come to my clinic and obviously we check the device and all the stuff and they say this is no big deal. But that's one thing you have to worry about. MRI, that's a, this is, these are all more clinical questions. These are not both questions. Pacemakers and MRIs, defibrillators and MRIs. So for many, many years, pacemakers and defibrillators means no MRI, okay? What's the problem with that? Magnetic field, what's the problem with this? What would happen? Somebody said? Heat up? Heat up the leads. So everybody thinks it's a can, because it's a big metallic can. Really, the problem is not the metallic can, it's actually the lead. The lead gets heat up and you can, you can actually make issues with the lead rather than the can itself. So we all think it's metallic syndrome. The metal is what we're worried about. It's the lead that we are worried about. So what has happened in the last seven, eight years, one company came up with a MRI safe pacemaker and leads. And then everybody started, now they're, now they're moving to slowly even defibrillators being MRI safe. It's not standard. Even to this day, if, if, nine, if 10 devices are put in Johnson City Medical Center, there's a good chance nine of them are not MRI compatible, okay? Also remember this, if somebody has a pacemaker and the pacemaker battery dies and you're going to put a new battery and you say, well, why don't we put a new battery which is MRI safe and they should be okay? Just a, like a clinical question. Those wires are stuck. You're not going to change the wires. And those wires are not MRI. So you can put an MRI can, but the wires are out. So if somebody had a device before which is not MRI compatible, that means it's no longer MRI compatible, just on the teaching purposes. Again, if, so don't, if, if there is a resident who does not know that there are MRI compatible devices, today you know there are MRI compatible pacemakers and if you, and you could also argue, so why, do, why do they not make all the devices MRI compatible? I think eventually that will be the case. Right now, if a pacemaker costs $100, I'm just throwing the number, pace, MRI pacemaker will be like $200. So there's a cost. They want to recuperate the thing. So there's a cost effectiveness and all this going on. But eventually, all pacemakers, defibrillators will all be MRI compatible, okay? Um, mammogram, everybody talks about mammogram causing MRI. It's more mechanical than actually the mammogram itself because when they do a mammogram, they actually 
press the thing really tight and actually patients can have severe pain where the mechanically where the pacemaker is put, especially if it's a new pacemaker put, you could have mechanical problems with that. Okay, we'll come here. So what is a pacemaker? What's an ICD? That is a common question. Many of you know this, third year residents know this, but for some of the interns, this, you have to know this also because you don't want to be, sometimes patients know more than you guys. It's a, doc, I have a pacemaker, you do not know about it. So what is the difference between a pacemaker and an ICD? So very simple, a pacemaker is designed to work when your heart rate is slow, right? So if your slow heart rate, pacemaker kicks in. But if you have a fast heart rate, what does pacemaker do? It just watches you, it can't do anything about it. That's a common misconception people have is, you put a pacemaker in me, my heart rhythm should be regularized. That's not true. Because you can still have AFib with RVR. <coughs> pacemaker is not gonna do anything for the AFib. At least directly, it's not gonna do anything for the AFib. But if you go slow, pacemaker kicks in. So that's a thing that you may have to communicate to the patient too. The reason we are putting pacemaker for your tachybrady syndrome is, if you are slow, the pacemaker kicks in. But if you are fast, we can give you medicines without the fear of dropping your heart rate. But pacemaker is not gonna work on your tachyarrhythmia, okay? Misconception one, actually commonly carried among internists and family practice doctors, but they don't know this part. Pacemaker is Brady indication. Now, defibrillators. Defibrillators are devices which something were to go wrong, it recognizes and shocks you back in rhythm, okay? So defibrillators are used for tachyarrhythmias. However, defibrillators also have basic pacemaker function. So what it means is everybody who has a defibrillator also has a pacemaker of some sort. Everybody who says that they have a pacemaker, they don't have a defibrillator. This is important too, because patients say, well, I don't know what I have, but I have something that shocks me, you know, at least, okay, wait a minute. Why am I telling this? Again, there are some internists that I know in practicing would not know the difference between a pacemaker and a defibrillator. All defibrillators are also pacemakers. All pacemakers are not defibrillators, okay? That's the terminology you have to know. Um, you could also ask, I used to have when I was a cardiology fellow and even as a, why not make all, everybody defibrillator? all pacemakers and defibrillators together, like it's one combination. There's a lot of reasons why you don't do. There's a lot of reasons why you don't do um, uh, both. One is probably the expense part of it. It's a bigger can, the devices are different, the lead is different, the leads are thick, it comes with its own complication. And pacemakers are a whole lot cheaper than defibrillators. So. Cost effective wise, if somebody does not meet a defibrillator indication, he just gets a pacemaker. Somebody, so that's where there's a lot of things going on in that direction. Um, a pacemaker is not an ICD and cannot shock. That's, that's an important thing to know. Okay, so now, uh, in the ICDs, you see this on your notes all the time, we talk about it. Uh, ICD, what does ICD stand for, okay? ICD, implantable cardiac defibrillator. It actually makes sense now as opposed to f maybe 15 years back is if, or even 10 years back. Uh, so the question was implantable cardiac defibrillator. The question was, what's the other kind? That was a question, right? You know, implantable, everybody gets it. I see that. You should have just called it as cardiac defibrillator. Why you call it as an implantable cardiac defibrillator? The reason now actually it makes even more sense is there is an external defibrillator version. What you guys are familiar with, LifeVest. How many of you have seen it, have heard about it? Good. How many of you have actually seen it? Good, very good, that's good. You have, this is, this is, these numbers are going up now. Many years back, if I said it, people would not have heard about it. But when you guys go out, this is a part of your training. You should know all this because this is not considered as extreme cardiology knowledge. You just have to know what is an external defibrillator, what are the simple indications that you don't have to know all the details, but you have to know what is an external defibrillator. So now there's an external cardiac defibrillator. Who gets it? Somebody who may need an implantable cardiac defibrillator, but you cannot put it now for different reasons. Either there's an infection or if he's not met all the guidelines, his ejection fraction is low, but you're still working on all the medicines. So until then, you get an external cardiac defibrillator. The, the company that makes it is called LifeVest. I'm sure there'll be more companies coming in future. Now, that is ICD. The next platform in the devices is called BiVICD. This is where, again, 
very commonly misunderstood among multiple practicing internists I know uh, who are in the field of hospitalists and, and, and they would not understand the difference between by V and a dual. So by V ICD means you are actually having resynchronization of the ventricle with two leads one in the right ventricular apex one in the outside of the left ventricle I love the extra outside of the left ventricle but you're trying to synchronize the heart this should not be confused with dual chamber ICD see that's how people get confused dual by V when you use the word dual chamber in electrophysiology it always means atrium and ventricle it does not mean ventricle and ventricle I use, you should not be using a by V ICD terminology dual chamber because it's a wrong message you're sending on your note oh, he's got two leads dual chamber ICD when you say dual chamber, dual chamber means atrium and ventricle, okay. By V strictly means 2V. So when you have a by V, you should not call it dual chamber. You should always call it by V because the terminology dual in, in electrophysiology is set for atrium and ventricle, okay. So now we have a single chamber pacemaker, dual chamber pacemaker, single chamber ICD, dual chamber ICD. Then you have the by V ICDs. The by V ICD is what uh, came out many years back everybody used the word by V by V. Now more scientific terminology is CRTD cardiac resynchronization therapy defibrillator or cardiac resynchronization therapy pacemaker what we call CRTD CRTP. Why should you know this? If you are taking care of a lot of transfer patients many big institutions have moved on to this terminology they don't use by V. So if I if you were to where I was in EP fellowship uh, the Mayo Clinic Jacksonville all the dictation notes would always say patient has this will qualify for CRTD and if you guys are now you buy well, I've never heard of CRTD you don't want to see this is CRTD so if you look at your uh, MK SAP also they moved on to use this terminology and that is the accepted terminology for now by V patient needs cardiac resynchronization therapy that's a much better terminology than by V um, a CID uh, all cr in, uh, devices is CID a single chamber dual chamber so now single chamber dual chamber wise just the picture wise where do they where do they put single chamber pacemaker if you were to put one pacemaker wire and it's usually going to be in the ventricle having said this in many places uh, in Europe uh, if you're if you don't have AV blocks and all you have is sinus bradycardia they put single chamber pacemaker in the atrium atrial lead and it's as cost effective but for some reason in United States uh, pacemaker is almost always dual chamber pacemaker unless patient has chronic AFib then it is a single chamber pacemaker with RV lead. Very rarely patients put a pacemaker lead just in the atrium because they think well what if something were to go wrong with the AV node I need to put one in the ventricle. Uh, electrophysiologist we put some atrial pacemaker, somebody who is young all he has is sinus bradycardia never had an AV nodal issue I put a simple single chamber pacemaker in the atrial lead. Why? less hardware less things can go wrong one set of screws one can one wire is not going to have any issues so just for the terminology part dual chamber pacemaker there's one pacemaker wire in the right atrium one in the right ventricle again more for intern, uh, in, uh, interns and maybe second years if you're not sure the pacemaker wire is in the right ventricle not in the left ventricle okay very important to recognize because you don't put a pacemaker wire in the left ventricular chamber there are multiple reasons why you do not want to put a wire in the left ventricular chamber. One of them would be anything in the left side, a small clot, stroke. Other thing is LV, arterial axis, pulsation, lot of issues. LV is contracts much more, blood pressure is much high and the leads can dislodge. So multiple reasons why pacemaker wires are on the right side of the heart, not on the left side. Now you could ask then question, how about cardiac resynchronization therapy? You say one in the RV, one in the LV. When we say one in the LV, it's not in the LV chamber. We still go through the right atrium, go through the coronary sinus, get outside the veins, and you are on the outside of the LV. So you are stimulating the RV apex and outside the LV, and you're trying to bring the synchronization of the heart. Okay, okay so now uh, if you look at a dual chamber pacemaker uh, example, we have a pacemaker uh, uh, thing here, uh, goes up an atrial lead and an RV lead okay so that will show you another okay then the difference between this versus this is there are two leads and you have one lead here what's the difference on this lead if you can note take a look at the lead because this is something you would want to know you look cool when you are in 
internal medicine rounding. Sometimes if you have this knowledge, many other people don't say, you look really cool. Patient says, I don't know what I have. And you look at the chest x-ray and say, this is what he has. Okay, so people, all, some of them already know this, which is good sign. The difference is what? So if you look at the wire here, pacemaker wire, you see this part of the wire, it's very thick. There is a thick coil here, coil here. Those are the two coils on the pacemaker wire. Why is it designed? It's designed to deliver shock, right? That is a defibrillator lead. So if somebody has a defibrillator lead, odds are he has a defibrillator, okay? So what, if you want to just take a look at the same thing here, see the wire is so smooth, there is nothing, there is no thickening of the lead anyway, just a simple wire. And then you go on, you see there's a clear cut RV coil, SVC coil, that's how we deliver shock through the, through the defibrillator. Again, it's more clinical knowledge than a bold question. It's not going to be a bold question. Uh, so there are shocking coils. That's a shocking coil here. Here, those are all coils, all the stuff. Those are cardiac defibrillators. Now, if you pay attention to this one, this is a, he's got patient has multiple wires. If you notice it, for sure you can see one of the pacemaker wires has a thick, so it has to be a defibrillator. And there is another lead going on the outside of the LV that's the bivia, the cardiac resynchronization ICD. So again, to show different pictures, single chamber ICD on the, on the left, dual chamber ICD, and biventricular device. If you look at it, the leader is on the outside. Again, clinical information. The reason I tell you guys all this is many a times if patients actually ask you guys this question, uh, a cardiologist did not spend enough time, however they want to say. And they will ask you, we explain all this thing, turn around, they'll call the internal medicines. Tell me a little bit about this, where is my wire sitting? And in spite of so many times, so much of education, patients always miss out something, they don't understand something. So it's good for you to have some basic concepts of pacemakers and ICDs, okay? So those are all the same pic different pictures showing ICD, CRT, where do they go and all this stuff, okay? Okay, now. How do you, who gets what is another question that's asked on your exam. This is a slide that we love in cardiology. We show it where almost all cardiology lectures will have this kind of slide. What is this slide? This is, cardiology is one very good field in medicine for us. I'm, obviously I'm biased with cardiology. Very well guideline driven. We probably, uh, oncology comes close but they keep changing the guidelines all the time. We, cardiology is very well set in that manner. The leading force, ACC, AHA, HRS, Sky, Everybody goes to the same terminology, it's wonderful. That's why in many ways we always say cardiologists are not smart because a lot of it is cookbook. A lot of it is much easier. That's why I tell running a cardiology clinic is much easier for me than running an internal medicine clinic. Because you guys got to know everything, all that. Ask all, cardiology, everything has, anytime you have a question, you fall back to some guidelines, it will give you an answer. And they're very clean. This is one, two, and that way you can actually tell the patient. The patient, doc, I'm feeling weak, put a pacemaker in me. So you can actually say who gets a pacemaker, who does not. There's class, there's very little if he thinks about it, okay? Uh, the reason is because of this. There is class one, two A, two B, and three in cardiology. What is class one? If this patient has a class one indication, you should offer the therapy to the patient. If you don't offer, you did something wrong. Class three, that means you should not be doing this procedure or should not be offering this medicine. So what will happen, and class 2A, 2B is, 2A is most people believe that this works. In 2B, some people that believe this For It's very easy for you guys. A board exam is never going to test you on 2A, 2B indications. It's always be, when should you do it? When should you not do it? The reason is, if you should do it and you did not talk about it or you did not offer, you did something wrong. And if you did something and you did not need it, you did something. So that's class one, class three. It's so very nice for everything you talk, talk about, interventions, PCI, ICDs, BIVs, pacemakers, even medications. And you guys talk currently on this with beta blockers. If you go back and read our literature, this class one for which one, why do you put metoprolol in it? It's class one. And even in class one, two, three, there is level of evidence A, B, C. It's a very well-driven society. It's, uh, that way, it's, it's very easy. That's why we can communicate very well. We have very little difference between cardiologists and managing because of this. The difference comes in is making up the indications. People say, well, I think it's New York Heart Association class two, and somebody says class three, and it depends on how you ask the question. But once you know what it is, the very set stone treatment-wise. So this is the reason I want to put this slide. This way, if I'm using the word class one, class three, you guys know what we're talking about. Level of evidence, ABC, all this stuff. So indication for permanent pacing, all these things are up there. 
Very simple. You, uh, you will get this PowerPoint, read it. By, you can always, when you are in a, on a day to day situation as a hospitalist, up to date, ACC, they all guidelines are there. Board exam is straightforward. Symptomatic sinus bradycardia and symptomatic AV block. The key word is symptomatic. So they will give you somebody's heart rate is 48 and he's a tennis player, has no issues. Don't do anything. Okay? Symptomatic sinus bradycardia. The big word is symptomatic sinus bradycardia. So what it means is if there is an asymptomatic bradycardia patient, you should not be putting should not be putting pacemaker. That's our class one, class three. That's that's the thing. All these things are there. Do not want to remember most complete heart block. That's another internal medicine board questions. We talked about it the other day. You need to recognize the EKG on complete heart block. In fact, I was just telling Dr. Stewart, I just before coming here I had a STEMI. And they called me for an inferior wall STEMI. I uh, said, cath lab, and we're ready to, patient is being prepped and raped. We're all, me and Dr. Bhatija were scrubbing and getting in. And they hook up the telemetry before we start the cath. And boom, there is complete heart block, you could see it. And I said, show me the inferior wall STEMI. And everybody got excited seeing a big inferior wall STEMI. But there is a beautiful complete heart block underneath inferior wall STEMI. And that's because of the right coronary artery. The management will still be almost the same. You fix the, you don't put a pacemaker for that. But what you want to do is to recognize complete heart block. You do not want to miss it. The only difference we did on that patient is put a temporary pacemaker first and then we've opened the RCA. But complete heart block EKG recognition is considered as uh, requisite for an internist. So I would want to make sure that the internal medicine doctors can recognize complete heart block. So I can ask an EKG of complete heart block and you recognize it. And usually it ends up in pacemakers. Almost all complete heart blocks get a pacemaker. The indications of not putting a pacemaker in complete heart block would be something that is very reversible. So if I give you a ditch toxicity in complete heart block, treat ditch toxicity. If I give you the classic stories, this patient that's described right now is actually a good question for board exam. Acute inferior wall ST elevation MI. There's a big thrombus sitting in the right coronary artery and is in complete heart block. You fix the RCA, you fix the STEMI, and then see what happens. That is, those are the two things that jumps out in my head as a bold question for internists. Don't do complete heart block pacemakers for a reversible cause, like medications, or classically it is inferior wall ST elevation MI. When you are working, if you guys go out and moonlight in the ER, that's another thing to recognize. You are so much focused on ST elevation MI, you forget to look at the complete heart block. That one we got just before, literally before getting the arterial stick, our needle moved to get the venous stick to get temporary pacemaker just by looking at that one. So you have to recognize that. Okay. No, okay. So the, all these are indications. We, in interest of time, make it simple. Uh, we talked about. See, look at this. This is all spacing sinus from class one C. And I get the busy slide. Uh, if you think about it, it has to be symptomatic. End of story. Don't try to memorize all this right now. Again, this is you'll get all this PowerPoint. You can use it. Even if you forget this, you put HRS guidelines for pacemaker. Boom! It'll show this shows up. Okay, it's very straightforward. Very little ambiguity there. Okay. So you look at that class, so permanent pacemaker implantation is not indicated for sinus node dysfunction when in asymptomatic patients, class three. So somebody walks and his heart rate is 15, he's doing great, don't do anything. The question is, people do something and they say, well, he's not doing great. I asked him the question, are you short of breath? And he says, no, are you short of breath? He says, no, are you really not short of breath? And he'll say, yeah, there you go, symptomatic bradycardia, good pacemaker. I've seen that happen. But if you're truly asymptomatic, do not put a pacemaker. Uh, let's go downstream uh, AV node his bundle. Uh, just the conduction system is up here for you guys. Uh, sinus node, AV node, uh, bundle of his, uh, Purkinje fibers, right bundle, left bundle. We'll talk about some of the common heart blocks. Venki Bach is asked on your exam. Again, most, most, almost 95% of the Venki Bachs leave it alone. On a board exam, almost 100% leave it alone. Nobody gets a pacemaker for a Venki Bach on a board exam, for sure. Actually, I don't think I put a patient pacemaker for a Venki Bach for any reason. Usually it is a vagal tone medicine. Some, you need to see something more than a Venki Bach to put a pacemaker. Venki Bach on a board exam, no pacemaker. Okay. Uh, pacemaker in 30, this is all, you don't, this is more for cardiology here. AV block, two is to one block. Two is to one block also has been tested on exams before. What is two to one block? One peak gets conducted, the other peak does not get conducted. 
What's the problem with this? You guys know three different AV blocks. First degree AV block is prolonged PR interval. Second degree AV block is PR gets prolonged, prolonged and you drop it. And then you have fixed one and you drop it. And then you have complete heart block. But if you have a two to one AV block, it does not fall in any category really. Reason is it's not complete heart block and it's not first degree AV block, but it, every other bit gets dropped. So you don't know whether it is second degree type one, which is Wenke Bach or second degree type two. And he said, well, does it make a difference? Actually, it does make a difference because Wenke Bach, as I said, you never put a pacemaker, be stable, leave it alone. Second degree type two, many patients end up getting pacemaker. There are two different routes. So if you have two to one, it can go in this direction or it can go in that direction. So if you, if you have a two to one block, one of the things you could do simple stuff in your clinical setting is just walk him and see how it responds. Because that way you may bring out the Wenke bar or you may bring out the other block. But when you say walk him, this is not, I always tell this to residents to don't put the orders and say, please walk him and tell him and call me when you're done. Because nurses will say walk him and he walks out and two to one and he's a high degree AV block and he gets three to one and he passes out and falls in a hip fracture. So you got a problem. So when you do this thing as a physician, this is one thing you own up the response. If, you go, if you're going to find out two to one block is Wenke Bach or this, you walk the patient yourself. In fact, two of one, you and the nurse on the other side and you walk and say somebody would get all the telemetry recordings for me and you actually see it and you have the answer. You could also give atropine and do it and you could also do an EP study to do it. Long story short, if you get two to one block when you are on a clinical situation, don't blow it off, right? So as an internist, you want to do good practice medicine, not call cardiology unnecessarily, not call gastroenterology unnecessarily. That's what you want to do. You want to manage everybody. If you see a first degree AV block, hey, he's doing well. I don't have to call cardiology, send him home. Wenke Bach, hey, patient has nausea, Wenke Bach, vagal tone, you don't have to call. You may call, but you don't have to. But when you have a second degree type two, don't take the ownership here. You say, well, they say type two, uh, second two to one conduction. I don't know which one it is call cardiology because if that one goes in the pacemaker direction, one does not. Certainly if you have complete heart block, you keep the patient called the cardiology for pacemaker, okay? So that two to one is an important uh, physiology. Then you have another concept called high degree AV block. I don't, not very well used among internal medicine docs. Cardiology, we see it all the time. You see this kind of block where you are conducting and suddenly you get four P waves and you don't conduct any one of them. Really, you cannot put this in any category. You cannot call this as first degree AV block. Can you call this second degree? This is my patient actually. Second degree type one, no. Type two, no. Not complete because the first part you're conducting. But for all practical purposes, this acts like complete heart block. So you look at that for so long, there's no conduction going on. So it's a high risk for something were to happen. Uh, this actually was turns out to be a sleep apnea patient during high vagal tone. She really knocks off the AV now but she had asymptomatic, but obviously we watched her more. Eventually she ended up getting a pacemaker because she started having dizzy spells. But this is high degree AV block, just for, so if you see this, you, you pay attention to this, okay? High degree AV block. Move on to this, complete heart block, we talked about it. Uh, third degree heart block, symptom, say what are the symptoms? Dizziness, syncope, sometimes you could get ventricular arrhythmias because of this. Um, okay, we move this. Too many slides will make it. Okay, so post STEMI uh, ST elevation MI. When you have an ST elevation MI, you could get a uh, um, complete heart block because of the AV node, because of the bundle branch block, or you could also develop uh, something where you get persistent and symptomatic second and third degree AV block. So on your exam, a question could be, you have a STEMI and you have a complete heart block, you say fix the STEMI. You can say put a temporary pacemaker, but do not put a permanent pacemaker during a STEMI event and a complete heart block, because usually it is reversible. Okay? There are indications where you actually think about it, but they will not test you guys on that. So my thinking is on a board exam, STEMI, complete heart block, treat STEMI, okay? Okay, we're moving. Bifascicular blocks, I will skip this. Carotid sinus hypersensitivity. This, I mean, I, for the completion sake, I put it here. The only thing I could see it from internal medicine perspective is just to recognize this syndrome. So the, the classic story is patient has recurrent episodes of syncope. The story goes when he's getting his tie on, sometimes has it or sometimes turning fast or gentle neck massage, he gets, passes out. Or on a tilt table, you do a carotid massage, he passes out. Carotid sinus hypersensitivity is a 
well-established diagnosis. And some people end up getting pacemakers. Actually, there's some young people who end up getting pacemakers because they're so sensitive, even just a, like a, a tight neck sweater or even tie, sometimes you turn around, and boom, they're driving and they pass out. I've seen one case in Jacksonville, uh, there's actually a corporate guy who has to wear a tie on a regular basis. And a lot of times he used to get dizzy, but he always said, when I will do this, I get that part. And sometimes, and a couple of times he passed out while getting dressed himself. And that was the uh, story. And eventually when we diagnosed, he had carotid sinus hypersensitivity, he ended up getting a pacemaker. Okay, uh, neurocardia, we'll forget him. Okay, where to back off, pacemaker not indicated. They, li they like questions when not to do things on board exams also. As an internist, they want you to be cost effective and not do inappropriate constant and inappropriate procedures. So keyword again, asymptomatic AV block, don't do anything. Asymptomatic second degree type one, don't do anything. And an AV block, which is due to a reversible clock, don't do anything, okay? So if you are take home from this pacemaker part of the lecture, you say symptomatic bradycardia, I will do something. Anything that is reversible, I will correct the patient. If you take out these two, 95% of the questions on pacemaker part, you will answer it. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me see. Again, this PowerPoint, you will get it. So I had to put different, how do they look and all kinds of stuff, first for teaching purposes, just to make it even, I don't, I'm not a spokesperson for anything. So I'm sure there's one from each company. Medtronic's injured, plus, yeah, all four, all four big players are here. So that way nobody complains, they're all here. Uh, they're getting smaller and smaller, smaller. I remember as a resident, I admitted a patient in the VA and Vanderbilt had put a defibrillator this big in the belly. That was a defibrillator many years back. I opened the heart and the kind of, so they have come out to be small pacemakers. The microni pacemaker is like, it's almost like a quarter microni pacemaker, but they're coming smaller and smaller. They're packed with more energy than before. This one, they can, they can deliver 45, 46 joules on a device of this big. And they're very, very powerful. Do we believe in it? Absolutely. Trials and trials have shown all these patients with cardiomyopathy. Every, and every time in my clinic, I always see one patient who had a ICD shock for a true VFM. Without that, there's a good chance he may not have made it. It's a very, very, very useful device. People think, oh, ICD is, it is in cardiology when they do trials, many trials are stopped because they feel like patients are benefiting more. And so if you continue the trial, there's other patients are not doing well. Most, most of the ICD related trials were that case. They actually stopped many of them prematurely because there's a clear cut divergence in mortality benefits. All these MADI trials, they all stopped well before. So another common misconception is uh, why should we put this device and the only reason I would not put is patients is I'm a DNR, I don't want to be shocked, that's perfectly fine. Or if you feel like the life expectancy is poor anyway, don't do it. But if you have a classic cardiomyopathy indication, please consider ICD. So now, the other concept of ICD, primary versus secondary prevention. This is a part internal medicine residents should know. Just to make it easy for you to understand, about early 90s, early 90s, if you admit a patient with a defibrillator, it was a big deal. So you admit, I used to tell the president, I got a patient, he's got a defibrillator, everybody, oh, what, what happened? Oh, he had hokum, he had a cardiac arrest, and somebody put an ICD, oh, wow. everybody in group sees the patient, we're all happy, about, oh, this is, I saw a patient with ICD. Pacemaker, we saw it all the time. ICD, we never saw that many. Why? For you to get a defibrillator, you have to have an event, and you survive that event. It's usually a survivor of a cardiac arrest, or a QT interval, or a hokum, or something, those are the ones who got ICDs. So then, and, and then, Many people don't survive, so you don't get an ICD. So it, it was not a common diagnosis. Then the evolution was, how could I put an ICD to save somebody? So who gets ventricular arrhythmia? So that was a trial, MADI trial, cardiomyopathy. These are the patients. So now you guys don't know the history. So you feel like ICDs are used. I remember that when MADI trial came out and we, we, somebody presented and we were residents said, look at this, this trial is telling that if you have cardiomyopathy and if you have done all the right things, put all the medicines, and the ejection fraction is still low, they're at high risk for sudden cardiac death, he gets an ICD. Now that is called primary prevention. Nothing ever happened to this patient, but you're trying to prevent an ICD, I mean, VT death. That revolutionized cardiology and the field of electrophysiology. Imagine you went from putting one or two ICDs in a year in a fancy center, and people are putting 150, 200 ICDs in a cardiology practice, not even EP, just one person. You went from that to that, and it also helped in, I should not use this word, it also helped 
a development of electrophysiology fellowship to me. The reason is ICDs came in, the more and more ICDs and ablations packed on and then it became a separate fellowship by itself because now electrophysiologists could sustain their living because of all of this together. If not, if you're just ablations and you're not ICDs, uh, they, will, they would not, they will, the extra training would not work. So that's to me, the, always that's how it worked out. So the electrophysiology programs grew out and they started taking out the devices for EP. When I was a cardiology fellow just coming out, ICDs were still cardiology, a lot of cardiologists, but now almost it's locked to electrophysiology. Pacemaker, anybody can put it. ICDs are pretty much, if you are coming out now and you do not have privileges to put a defibrillator, very, very difficult for a cardiologist to get it because electrophysiology has taken it out completely to you have to do that EP to put ICD. So that primary prevention changed everything because you get a lot of patients get ICD and that is where now questions on ICD for you guys because it's a primary prevention. So there are a lot more patients with ICD. So every one of you have seen an ICD patient now. That was not the case when we were in our residency. You could do fellowship and some of them may not have cared for them. They may have seen somebody but they may not have cared for a patient who had an ICD. Pacemaker, yes, ICD, no. Okay. So all these trials, again, not to beat, beat it up, all these trials, the big one, if landmark trials, just for knowing the name is MADIT. MADIT 1 and 2 are the landmark trials in cardiology. There's some, I like the names of the trials, you don't have to. Some trials are more important than these other ones. This is not a simple trial that you just read, came out in something. This is a landmark trial which got accepted by insurance companies, Medicare, Heart Rhythm Society, everybody and the funding came out. This is because it is expensive equipment. For them to say it helps, it has to be good. So those are MADIT trials, 96, MADIT 2, 2002. All these are trials. Again, not, you don't need to know the details of it. So that, that question that now we got about 10 minutes, we'll finish up in five and ask take questions. So what they're asking a, a question here is chest pain, massive anterior wall STEMI, patient is taken to the cath lab. During the cath lab, due, on, on the way he had a VFib and PCI, EF is L, which of the following is appropriate? This is actually a very good internal board question, internal medicine board, this is not cardiology. The question that they're trying to ask is two, two things here. One you have to know is somebody is having an acute MI and he has a cardiac arrest, you don't put an ICD for secondary prevention because that's ac acute MI. That itself is a question by itself. So you can just give you this and say, which of the following is not indicated in this patient or Usually they shy away from not indicated, they're asking you which of the following is indicated. So you could say aspirin, beta blockers, but certainly not an ICD in somebody who had an MI and during an MI event he had a cardiac arrest, okay? That is one question by itself. The second question goes on to make even more, they say ejection fraction is 25%. Now they're trying to build a case. There is still another trap. You say, well, you just had an MI, you just put a stand and you look at an echocardiogram, it's going to be low anyways. So what they're trying to ask you is, anytime you are trying something to make the ejection fraction better, you should give some time. Three months is usually the time. But they want you to know, he may have had a cardiac arrest, don't put an ICD. He may have a low EF, but don't put an ICD yet, because he's just coming out of an MI, okay? So in those choices, it's a, which of the following is appropriate, immediate ICD now, because of those two conditions. ICD implantation after 40 days, if you have an MI, that calendar kicks for 40 days for sure, but this patient not just had an MI, he had a revascularization so that kicks it out for three months. Then say EP study, it's usually nothing. ICD after three months does not mean that after three months, ejection fraction may be good. You don't need to put an ICD. Repeat ejection fraction evaluation after three months. That is the answer. So there are concepts here you have to recognize. Do not put an ICD during, if somebody has an event during an MI, or if you had an MI and you check an EF right after the MI, you have not done anything to the patient yet to know whether the ejection fraction got better. So you have to have good medical therapy, revascularization, then you reassess the EF in three months. You can talk about a possible ICD with the patient. Nobody's going to say no. You're going to say, hey, you may need it, but do not put it. That's actually is becoming a popular question on board exams. Like ICD, survivor of cardiac arrest, I'm going there here. I think we'll have to talk about post MI will, by V is the one we talked to. So ICD not indicated, we talked about it. If you think the patient has a poor chance of survival, one year roughly, so that somebody has got a lung cancer, metastatic lung cancer, bones, brain, don't put ICD, don't say even call cardiology. 
So that is a question that's asked on your exam. But they make it very clear. They do not give you iffy scenario. They will not give you non-heart skin lymphoma responding to therapy. Patient is doing well because now you say, well, I don't know the prognosis. They'll give you clear cut. Somebody is so, uh, multiple meds, you've given up, don't put an ICD. That's the indication. One other question that they could ask for an internist is, you put an ICD and he gets shocked and he comes in and now he has prostate cancer with bone meds and he says, doc, turn off my ICD. I don't want to be shocked. And you talk to him, he's aware, colored, oriented, all the stuff. What do you do? You turn off the ICD. Do, the question is on the internal medicine boards is very simple. They trick you all the time. Uh, call cardiology to discuss this, call EP. You may do all this thing, but on the board exam, they're very straightforward. He's got problems. He does not want to be shocked. He's aware of the consequences. And you also think it may not help him. You can pull the plug. You say, I'm not, take off the ICD function. It is, it is very, do not say ethics consult. In fact, I'll put it this way, easy way to remember on your exam. If there is a question with answer consult ethics committee, it sounds wrong, okay? It's because they're telling you, you're just putting more confusion in play. You will do it in your life, different story. Board exam is very straightforward. They said, what do you mean by ethics? Patient is talking to you, awake or patient's uh, distant uncle comes in, he's asking all this stuff, he wants to know everything, he took care of this patient when he was young. You may do that, call everybody. You don't say ethics consult. They will make you common sense. Just use a common sense. Don't pick consult ethics committee on a board exam. It's never, and same thing for me, if you're taking EP boards, I'm about to put an ICD, I'm not sure whether it's getting infection or not, consult ID, it's, I may consult all the time, but I say, I say never consult, it's your decision, okay? So they will ask them, the controversy is this though, ICD, you can turn it off, no big deal. However, if somebody says, take off my pacemaker function, and is pacemaker dependent, that is a catch. If somebody says, somebody's heavy block, complete heavy block, you got a pacemaker put in 10 years back, now he's 95 years old, metastatic bone cancer, hospice. He says, turn off my pacemaker. That is a controversy for a long time, it's now long. So what do you do, anybody? So you, now Heart Rhythm Society had a very good, nice thing, you're actually legally, you're okay. If you want, they leave it to the physician. If you want to do it, you're okay. The only, I would not do it. I will tell you my thing is, and it, and it also gives you room for a physician to say, I don't believe in this part. I feel like my, me doing it will actually, do, so I don't want to do it, you're, you're entitled to say it too. But at the same time, if you do it, you're no wrong or wrong. In the past, it, the controversy was if you do it, it was called as euthanasia, because you think this way, he's pacemaker dependent, and you turn off the pacemaker, and no matter what hospice, whatever it is, you're talking in the next three minutes, it will go right in front of you. And you, and you felt like you are the one who, it, it depends on it, but it, it used to be, people said, well, if you do it, it's like no different than giving potassium and all that stuff, controversy was there, and physicians were so cautious but now the rule has come out and said, well, think about taking out the pec tube. Somebody says, I don't want it, and you know he's going to starve to death. We did not cause the condition. He already had a complete heart block, so we're just pulling it. So you're okay, you're, you're supported by doing it. Nobody's going to come after you. On a principal level, if you don't feel like you're comfortable, you don't want to do it. So I will always tell, I will turn off the defibrillator with patient's wishes, but I will never turn off the pacemaker with patient. That's me. But for an exam purpose, you can do both. They will not ask you pacemaker question for sure. That is above internal medicine level. But defibrillator question is very legitimate, okay? I will stop it at here because we got three minutes to go. One thing about BIV is all the indications for ICD, we have it. You just have to have a wide QRS and New York Heart Association class through. That is the thing. Again, it's written in books. But the important thing to remember is, do you need to know the indication for by VICD, CRTD, absolutely yes, for exam. Okay, you have to know that. I, we talked about PACER, ICD, and by V. So I'll stop it here, I'll take questions. I'm sure some of them have any questions. When you had some question, I saw you raise your hand, yes. Correct, there are, what question is asking is there are patients with ventricular tachycardias, would you put ICDs and all? There are some tachycardias which are considered as treatable with ablations. You don't need to put an ICD for that. And there are some which you have a sustained monomorphic VT, you put an ICD. I don't think they'll play that game with you guys. However, if I give you congenital QT interval syndrome, patient is swimming and he drowns and you bring him out and there's a tachycardia going on, that says secondary prevention. Patient had a cardiac arrest with congenital QT, gets an ICD. 
Somebody with hokum playing basketball falls, collapses. You go there, there's a VTAC, that's a secondary prevention, gets an ICD. Hokum and congenital QT will be the two players for you guys on your exam. ARVC is a little bit about outflow track tachycardias, they're not going to ask you. So don't bother about it. If they go for a secondary prevention, hokum and congenital QT interval. These are the two secondary prevention ICDs that come on your exam. What is the difference between CRT? D and CRTP. CRTD and CRTDP is pacemaker versus defibrillator. Cardiac resynchronization therapy, defibrillator means it does the pacing, can also shock you. CRTP is it just pacemaker, there is no shocking component. So when I say BIV, 95% of the BIVs are actually BIV ICDs. There are very few patients who have BIV pacemakers. And that's a CRTD, CRTP. That's the difference, CRTP. And their indication, they're not going to play with what's, a, they will never ask you an indication for a BIV pacemaker. If you're going to maximize your effort to read, look at the indications for ICD and BIV ICD. Pacemaker, you will guess it. They will never ask you BIV pacemaker. Don't even bother to about this for now. But BIV ICD, they will ask you. Yes, sir. I saw a patient in the community health center that you put an ICD in, he has no insurance. And I was curious about the cost of the device itself. Yeah, it's like a pacemaker, a, a dual. Correct. Or? As the in the platform, that's a very good question. Actually, it's a constant dilemma that we run into. You have a pacemaker, defibrillator, and bivy, right? As you go up, it's phenomenally expensive. Very, very expensive. Uh, pacemaker, easy way to think. If you put a pacemaker, not many people are monitoring the pacemaker guidelines. ICD guidelines are very strict. Medicare, everybody is following it because you're talking the equipment itself is a good 20 grand difference between an ICD and pacemaker. Equipment itself, the implantation technique, everything you add together, it could be a matter of $10,000 versus $50,000. So what will happen for us is you get a young patient and he gets this um, uh, uh, cardiomyopathy and you do all the right things and he gets so if he gets out as an outpatient, as a primary prevention for an ICD, now it becomes a problem because it comes out on his head and all the stuff. Sometimes we have a long chat and all the stuff. We wave off what we do, but some people say, well, do this thing, I'll write off, I'll take care of the spot. So most ICDs, if you do it as an in, in the in, in hospital procedure for prevention and there's a system, hospital en ends up eating the cost. And that's, they say, and even the pacemaker companies are supposed to drop off the charge for them because it's obviously you don't want to be putting all the patients but there are if you if you make a very strong case and a patient who without insurance who needs an ICD uh, you end up putting it but everybody takes the cost but the problem will come is follow up though you may take up the cost up front but they just to follow with somebody and we say as from university we say our door I say keep our doors open they come in we check it it's not a problem but it becomes a huge equipment uh, issue um, I don't know whether, was that a secondary prevention or a primary prevention on that patient? Usually secondary prevention, we do it whether you have insurance or not because he survived a cardiac arrest. Primary prevention, we talk with them and say there's a good chance you'll be stuck with a fat bill and some people don't want it to be done. Some people with insurance also do not want primary prevention ICD. He said, Doc, I will take my chance, let me go. But you have the discovery, but you're obliged to offer. It's class one, if you don't offer, you're some, you didn't do something. He did not do the right thing. Because he has a cardiac arrest, he'll come back and say, that cardiomyopathy, nobody ever offered us this part. But very expensive. That ICD, ICD industry itself is very expensive. Very good. Uh, anticoagulation and anti. So if somebody is on aspirin and Plavix, I'd never stop it for an ICD. I'll put ICD through that. If you are on Humidin, more and more studies have shown that if you have a simple implantation, they tend to have very minimal, there's no higher increase in incidence of anything. So I've actually done ablations, pacemakers, and ICDs on Humidin. Not on everybody, somebody has a mechanical valve, I weigh the benefit, and I do it. Things can go wrong, however, it's considered to be safe. You're protected by books, so it's not like you did something completely wrong. His INR is 2.5, I put a pacemaker on 2.5, you're not wrong. Because literature has shown that there is not a statistical big difference between therapy. However, if you do it on a patient with low anox or heparin, there's a higher incidence. Go figure that one. Cumidin probably okay, low anox cumidin. So aspirin and plavix, I never worry about it. Cumidin, if it is a simple indication, I stop it and do it. However, if it's a mechanical valve, through the cumidin, I put the ICD. You can put it. Actually, the CT surgeons are the ones who are scared. Most of the EP people will do it. 
Do you have a question? If you were to go with a single chamber pacemaker, I think you've covered it in a young patient with no other, you would go with the right atrium rather than the right ventricle. How about if in down the road, you develop the AV node disease, isn't it better to that's, that's, that's why United States uh, people say, well, in future he needs it and all the stuff. The argument for, for against it in Europe is, is a young guy in future is about 25 years from now. And in 25 years, you, the wire that you put is not good in 25 years. So you will put a wire today anticipating for using it in 25 years. And when time comes, it's not going to be working. You are, and then the vein is closed now because you have two wires. You are better off going back at, at that time is one. So arguments both ways. But in the United States, you're right. If I put a pacemaker, everybody, 95% they put dual chamber pacemaker. They don't want to take that risk. You have litigation and all that stuff. In Europe, if there is no AV nodal disease, a lot of them get a single chamber atrial pacemaker. Here, if you see a single chamber atrial pacemaker, you will be like, wow, everybody is excited. Nobody puts it. When do we actually go with a dual chamber versus a single chamber? What is the indication? Complete heart block, which is actually a relatively common indication. If you have complete heart block, even though the sinus node is intact, you have to put a dual chamber. Reason is, for you to know when to pace the ventricle, you need to know what happens in the atrium. How do you know what happens in the atrium? You have to have an atrial lead. So you may not use it for pacing, you need to use it for sensing. So if a patient has complete heart block, the problem is in the AV node and below, but you still end up putting two dual chamber pacemaker. So anytime you see AV sources. Correct. AV blocks, dual chambers, sinus brady, atrial. That should be the right way. But in the United States, 95% of the pacemakers are dual chamber pacemakers. Correct. The cardiac device interrogation has become a, a field by evolution big time. So it's a very good question for an internist. Rule of thumb is in, if you have somebody who has a pacemaker on ICD, Medicare recommends twice a year that they will reimburse minimum of twice they say. There are cardiologists who have very busy practice they say if everything is going well once a year. I would usually say for a pacemaker twice a year. ICD also I go twice a year. However, if they have cardiomyopathy, CHF coming in, I will probably do every three months. But most patients you do twice a year. That is checking the device in home. Now these devices are radio frequency now. It's awesome. This device, I mean, even it amazes me. I'm in this field all the time. The technology is so good. So they go, they have an instrument at home. They hook it up to landline. They go home, they get to bed. It automatically downloads every day. It does not program. It downloads and sends me. So this is called home monitoring. And the Medicare will pay you for monitoring the device for every three months. So that you monitor, you can catch AFib. I've caught so many things. You can catch AFib, heart failure, all those things you can catch it. And they're very good. Now, now these days are very good. They are wireless programmers. So I can actually have iPad in my office and the device check, guys checking it and he'll screen it to my iPad. You can actually program the device from here without ever putting a wand on them. So very, very good. Home monitoring is revolutionized device checker. Battery life, good question. Pacemakers these days, when it used to be four, five years, now they're 10, 12 years. ICDs used to be five years. They're also now seven, eight years. Bivies are about six, seven years. So most of them are above five years. Pacemakers are about 10, 12 years, pacemaker. And the wires? Wires last, the wires have gotten better, the cans have gotten better, the smaller, better power. The devices are just, they, they do, once everybody, this competition, so everybody says, I, we do this, the other company says, we catch up with you, and they do something more. They keep on beating the technology. It, it is fantastic. I mean, I'm going to San Francisco next year, next week, and I'm going. They have leadless pacemakers now, right? They go from the groin and put a small chip in the RV, and that's leadless pacemaker. There's no lead. That's, that's the next time going on. What about the subcutaneous uh... ICD? So that's um, it's a good question. I've seen many in here. Eventually, he's going to see if somebody need meets an indication for a defibrillator. But you say we put a defibrillator, I said all defibrillators are pacemakers, there's one catch to it. Recently they have made some defibrillators which are not going through the subclavian vein, it's not in the heart, it's outside, the sub subcutaneous ICD. The indication is if you need an ICD but there is no pacing indication, you can do a subcutaneous ICD. It will recognize and shock you out of this. So that has become more popular, Emory does a lot. We are doing it too, we just got privileges here also. So we are doing subcutaneous ICDs, which is, you may start seeing that also now. And you can deliver higher energy They deliver because you're from outside. So they're about usually 80, 90 joules. Subcutaneous ICD is a different. So implantable cardiac defibrillator, external defibrillator, and they're called sub-Q ICD. There's only one company which does it right now, Boston Scientific, but I'm sure everybody will come up on it. And from a skin infection near the device pocket, 
Correct. So, An good. Another internist question that you should know, not inter clinical. So, if you if you have a pacemaker and pacemaker infection, some common guidelines about pacemaker infection. If you have a stitch infection, stitches where they put the stitch, or if you have a skin infection, if you don't think it is in the pocket, you're okay to start antibiotics. You can still call EP, whatever. But if you think the infection is in the pocket, everything comes out. That's a, if the wires are settled for 10 years, you actually have to do laser lead expectation. Another rule is if you can see the device, for some reason the device eroded, you can see it, and there's no signs of infection, that is infection. If you see the device, never ever send the patient home. That's a teaching point for you because you are maybe practicing in an ER situation, the doctor says, no fever absolutely and you're examining, you just take out the shirt for something else, he's got some other issue going on and there you see this tiny place where you can actually see the device. That is infection because once you see the device, it needs to come out. We had one uh, last week, I was actually in Nashville when it happened to one of our patients, I had to transfer to Nashville, we coordinate. Patient fell and he had a thin thing and device eroded. You could actually see it, no infection, but the whole thing comes out. We get this question all the time in the uh, exams that, you know, patient comes in with recurrent shocks and do a kidney particular. What do you do for recurrent shocks? If you have recurrent ICD shocks, the questions could be multiple things. The recurrent ICD shocks could be appropriate shock or inappropriate shock. If they tell you it's an inappropriate shock, the lead fracture, recurrent shock, and the patient is shocking, right? and you obviously call the device company guy to come and turn off or now. If you want to stop shocking on a patient immediately, right then and there, what would you do? The easiest thing to do is put a magnet on it. So a very common sense question also to those, very good question. Most units have a magnet, right? So you recognize it and say, he gets an ICD shock, he's on the telemetry, there's nothing going on, but he got a shock. And the lead is fractured. So you just put a magnet, it turns off the ICD function. Does it also turn off the pacer function? Good question. If it is an ICD, it turns off the ICD function. If it's a pacemaker, it does not turn the pacemaker function. It stops sensing. What it means is, if, the, if a pacemaker is supposed to beat at 60 times per minute, it will deliver the spike at 60 no matter what's happening. He is maybe AFib with RVR with 140, but he will get a pacemaker spike. So when you put a magnet on a pacemaker guy, you take out the sensing. You pace constantly. But you put the same on a defibrillator guy, you take out the defibrillator function. It's a very good clinical, I don't think it's a board question, but it's a fantastic question for an internist because you are, you are a hospital, you're sitting there, you'll call cardiology, fellow is somewhere, somebody calls and put a magnet. He's not gonna get a shock. But you wanna make sure that it's in a, you don't wanna put a magnet and he's in VFEB. Then you'll be shocking from the outside. Yeah, they're cool equipment, I'm telling you. The, if in this field, I, I get fascinated every year because they come up and say, man, why did I think about it? Because they always say in EP, it's not the physicians who made the revolution, the engineers who made the revolution, we just take the credit for what they're doing. Questions? Good. It's so many, first time, so many questions, it's good. It's very good. That means we have done some stimulation. Thanks, guys.